The curtain rises on Act 3, Scene 3 towards dawn. The candles are no longer burning. The intense darkness of the dugout is softened by the glow of the very lights in the sky beyond the doorway. There is no sound except the distant mutter of the guns. It's the morning of the attack. The dugout is a very different place now. It's no longer festive as it was when the men were eating their celebratory meal. It's cold and dark. There comes the rasp of a striking match, a tiny flame, and a candle gleams. Mason has come into the dugout to wake a solitary Stanhope. Stanhope reveals that he was only half asleep anyway, as it's so frightfully cold in here. Mason tells Stanhope that he's made some hot tea, which Stanhope asks to bring for him as well as give to the other officers when he goes to wake them up. In contrast to Stanhope, who rises stiffly from his bed, shuddering from the cold as he slowly begins putting his equipment on, Trotter wanders in from his dugout, vigorously lathering his face as he prepares to have a shave. He is dressed except for his collar. He appears just as jovial as normal, seemingly unaffected by the excesses of the night before, or by the anticipation of the attack to come. He explains that he was able to have a decent sleep when he came off duty, but we mustn't take this at face value after his comment to Stanhope in the previous scene. It's not that he's unaffected, it's the way he chooses to cope with the horrific conditions and fear of imminent death that affected them all. Trotter remarks that, at the moment, it sounds quiet enough out there, although we know that this is just the calm before the storm. Mason comes back in with tea and explains that he has cut a packet of sandwiches, or sandwiches, for each gentleman. It's clear that the men are not going to be able to sit down to a civilised breakfast today, not only because they have to be ready as soon as the German attack reaches their part of the front line, but also because Mason, once he has cleared up his kitchen, will be expected to dress and join his platoon in the line. When Stanhope is alone, he sits at the table and begins to write a short report, which he orders a runner to take to battalion headquarters, presumably letting them know that it is currently quiet at their section of the line. The silence is broken by a plaintive noise from the other dugout. It's Trotter singing There's a Long, Long Trail a Winding, which was a popular song of the First World War. In a rare moment of playfulness, Stanhope takes a few small coins from his pocket and throws them into Trotter's dugout. The singing stops abruptly. After a moment, Trotter's voice comes. Thank you kindly, Governor as though he is a busker on the street thanking a passer-by for giving him some money. The Sergeant Major comes down the steps to inform Stanhope that the wiring party are just in, sir, made a decent job of it, right down the support line. We also find out that, even though it is quiet right opposite here, sir, the guns are going hard down south. Heavy bombardment. Not sure if it ain't spreading up this way, sir. This is the news we've been dreading, and the tension starts to build as we realise that the attack is moving inexorably towards them. Stanhope orders the Sergeant Major to make sure the men have a decent drop of rum in their tea, to take the edge off their fear. The way in which they agree it should be half as much again as they are normally given is another indication that what they are about to face is going to be major. The men are, however also living with the uncertainty of when the attack will actually come. Stanhope tells the Sergeant Major that we must expect the attack any time up to midday. After then, I don't think it'll come till tomorrow. The Sergeant Major exits as Mason returns, bringing four little packets of sandwiches and puts one on the table for Stanhope. He announces that they are half bully beef and half sardine. Sardine on top, sir. Bully beef is another name for what we now call in the UK corned beef, which is finely minced beef that has been preserved in brine or salt water and canned. 
This rather unappetising selection gives Stanhope one last opportunity to make a joke about the quality of the food. How delicious. No pâté de foie gras? He is, of course, being ironic. Pâté de foie gras is a French pâté made from the liver of specially fattened geese. It was then, and still is, considered a luxury product that only the wealthy can afford, and so we know that Stanhope is not being serious. Mason is, as ever, inscrutable, as he gives nothing away about how he feels. How much of Stanhope's little joke he actually gets is up for debate. He can obviously tell that Stanhope doesn't mean it when he says how delicious. And even though he may not know exactly what pâté de foie gras is, he will be able to tell that it's some kind of fancy foreign food. The way in which he responds, no sir, the milkman hasn't been yet, suggests that he is attempting to at least play along with the joke, even if it is in his customary deadpan manner. It's at this point that the attack begins to reach Stanhope's part of the line and the tension, temporarily suspended by the moment of humour, returns. Suddenly there comes the faint whistle and thud of falling shells, a few seconds between each. Stanhope and Trotter listen intently. Four shells fall, then silence. Stanhope goes up the steps to look out. When he returns, he reports that the attack is taking place over on Lancer's Alley, somewhere by the reserve line. This is important, as this is some kind of support or communication trench which will be used to ferry supplies and take any wounded soldiers to the aid station. It's an ominous sign that the men are getting increasingly cut off from the rest of their side. There comes the louder thud of three more shells. The time has come and Trotter calls to Hibbert and Raleigh to come on. This is Trotter's final appearance on stage and he exits with the same cheerful demeanour and sense of fortitude that we have seen exhibited throughout. Cheero, Skipper. See you later. Stanhope is briefly left alone. Note how, even though he appears to have it all together on the surface, his quivering hand as he lights his cigarette betrays him. Raleigh enters, but Stanhope's only reaction is to lower his head and write in his notebook. The two have clearly not made up, and the awkwardness between them means that the atmosphere can almost be cut with a knife. Stanhope remains with his head lowered all the time he is interacting with Raleigh, unable to meet his eye. The awkwardness continues as Raleigh bids Stanhope goodbye. Right. He goes up the steps and turns shyly. Chiro, Stanhope. Stanhope still writing with lowered head. Chiro, Raleigh. I shall be coming up soon. Raleigh goes up the steps. Note how Stanhope is only able to raise his head once Raleigh has gone. What this does signal to the audience is that this cannot be their last interaction, leaving as it does so much unresolved between them if the play is to have a satisfactory, if not necessarily a happy, ending. Hibbert, as to be expected, is nowhere to be seen, and Sanope has to call him twice before he makes an appearance in the dugout. He's very pale, he moves as if half asleep. Note how he tries delaying tactic after delaying tactic in order to avoid going up into the fighting. He asks for water, claiming... I'm so frightfully thirsty. All that champagne and stuff dried my mouth up. All the while, Hibbert is playing for time. The shelling is steadily increasing, and now, above the lighter crush of the smaller shells, there comes the deep, resounding boom of the Minnenwerfer. Hibbert sips his water very slowly, rinsing his mouth deliberately with each sip. Stanhope is by the doorway looking up into the trench. He has just turned away as a sonorous, drawn-out call comes floating through the dawn. Stretcher-bearers! This is bad news. The stretcher-bearers were the soldiers who would collect the wounded from the battlefield and carry them through enemy fire to an aid station or field hospital, often to find that the casualty was already dead before they got there. 
Someone has been wounded, suggesting that the attack has significantly ramped up. But just who is it? Hibbert is still playing for time, however. When Stanhope tells him to buck up, he merely responds, There's no appalling hurry, is there? Stanhope is incredulous, as communicated through his use of a rhetorical question. No hurry? Why do you think the others have gone up? Stanhope hasn't got time for Hibbert's shenanigans and lets him know that he can see right through him. The longer you stay here, the harder it'll be to go up. Hibbert pretends to be surprised and offended at Stanhope's insinuation that he is deliberately putting off going up because he is scared. Good Lord, you don't think I'm... Stanhope is now blunt with him. You're wasting as much time as you can. How much sympathy do we have for the character of Hibbert at this point? Yes, he's petrified. In the true sense of the word, as he appears almost as though he's been turned to stone. And we know that we would feel exactly the same in similar circumstances. The stage directions describe him as being the picture of misery. Yet, we compare his behaviour with the calm and stoic acceptance of their duty of Trotter, Raleigh and now Mason, who appears on cue, fully dressed for the line, his rifle slung over his shoulder. I'll go right along, sir. I've made up the fire to last a good three hours, if you don't mind me popping down about nine o'clock to have a look at it. We can't help but feel a slight measure of contempt for him. Stanhope is spared a further confrontation with Hibbert, however, as Mason, as luck would have it, asks him, I'd like to come along with you if you don't mind, sir. I ain't been up this part of the front line. Don't want to get lost. Stanhope jumps at the opportunity to finally get rid of Hibbert. Mr Hibbert will show you the way up. He turns to Hibbert. Keep your men against the back wall of the trench as long as the shells are dropping behind. Cheero! And with that dismissal, Mason and Hibbert make their final exit into an uncertain fate. Hibbert, with a slight smile, Go slowly up the steps and into the trench, Mason following behind. The tempo of the scene begins to quicken, as no sooner than Hibbert and Mason have departed, a dark figure comes hurrying down the steps, a private soldier, out of breath and excited, with a report from Trotter that shells are falling mostly behind the support line, Minnie's or Minenwerfer, along the front line, and that Corporal Ross has been injured. The Sergeant Major now enters very much out of breath to confirm that Corporal Ross has been hit pretty badly and that the action is getting pretty hot. As the audience, we feel momentary relief that, even though this is sad news, it is not one of the characters with whom we have bonded over the course of the play. We also find out that the shelling is bad over the trenches to such an extent that the stretcher bearers' routes to the field hospitals have been obstructed. Stanhope gives the order that the wounded should be taken instead to the big dugout on the right, where the stretcher bearers will be able to do what they can there. This is bad news. Although stretcher bearers would have had a rudimentary training and have gained experience in the field, they were in no way medical officers, and so it seems that anyone who is unfortunate to be wounded is doomed to die of their injuries, even though they might have been saved if they'd got proper medical attention. Note the way that immediately after the Sergeant Major confirms that only Corporal Ross has been hit, there comes the drawn-out call several times as it is passed from man to man. Stretcher bearers! It seems he has spoken too soon. This time it has to be someone we know, surely. The sounds of the battle raging outside intensify in synchrony with the tension felt by the audience as we wait to find out who has been wounded. Flying fragments of shell whistle and hiss and moan overhead. The sharp crack of the rifle grenades, the thud of the shells and the boom of the Minenwerfer mingle together in a muffled roar. At last, the Sergeant Major returns with the news we've been dreading. Mr Raleigh's been it, sir. Bit of shells got him in the back. Afraid it's broke his spine, sir. Can't move his legs. 
He's paralysed and is in need of urgent medical attention. Stanhope orders that instead of being taken to the dugout as previously arranged, he be brought into this dugout, presumably so we can get the farewell scene between them that we have, up to this point, been denied. While the sergeant major is gone, arranging for Raleigh's removal, Stanhope busies himself making up a bed. He fumbles a blanket over Osborne's bed, taking a trench coat off the wall and rolling it for a pillow. The Sergeant Major returns with Raleigh in his arms. We learn that he is dying. They have merely dressed the wound because they can't do no more. In direct contradiction of his previous orders, Stanhope commands that two men with a stretcher be brought. The Sergeant Major's response that we'll never get him down, sir, with them shells falling on Lancer's alley indicates that Stanhope is determined to do everything in his power to save Raleigh's life, even if it is futile. Note that he wasn't willing to risk his men to do something similar for Corporal Ross. The Sergeant Major exits, leaving Stanhope and Raleigh alone. Stanhope goes to the table, pushes his handkerchief into the water jug and brings it, wringing wet, to Raleigh's bed. He bathes the boy's face. Presently, Raleigh gives a little moan, opens his eyes and turns his head. All of the hostility that Stanhope was feeling for Raleigh has now completely evaporated, as he gently tends to his old school friend. When Raleigh finally speaks, he addresses Stanhope as Dennis. Stanhope, instead of correcting him, responds in kind, addressing him as Jimmy, signalling a moment of tenderness not between a commanding officer and one of his men, but between two childhood friends. The pathos begins to build. Raleigh is unaware of the severity of his wounds. He recollects that something hit me in the back, knocked me clean over, sort of winded me. I'm all right now, he tries to rise. I'll be better if I get up and walk about. It happened once before. I got kicked in the same place at Rugger. It it soon wore off. It, it just numbs you for a bit. The way he draws a parallel between this and a rugby injury would have perhaps reminded the contemporary audience of the famous poem by the female poet Jessie Pope, entitled Who's for the Game, in which she jauntily and jingoistically encouraged young men to enlist to fight in the First World War by likening it to the rough and tumble of a rugby match. Raleigh's reference also adds another layer of poignancy to the scene as it forces us to remember that he has only just left school. Raleigh begins to suspect that his injuries may be more serious than he thought, uneasily asking Stanhope, it, it hasn't gone through, has it? It only just hit me and knocked me down. Stanhope, perhaps unable to face it himself, can't bear to tell him the complete truth. It's just gone through a bit, Jimmy. I'm going to have you taken away, down to the dressing station, then hospital, then home. He smiles. You've got a blighty one, Jimmy. Blighty was slang for England, and a blighty one was a wound which was sufficiently serious to require hospital treatment in England. It was usually considered a piece of luck, which says an awful lot about the desperation many men felt to go home. Raleigh refuses to believe it, however, until he tries to raise himself, which makes him give a sudden cry. He suddenly realises that he is unable to move his legs. He thinks that something is holding them down. Stanhope now outright lies. He knows that Raleigh, even if he were to survive, would never walk again, but there is clearly nothing to be gained from telling him the truth now. It's all right, old chap, it's just the shock numbed them. Note how in a parallel to Hibbert, Raleigh asks Stanhope if he may have just a drop of water. Putting on a false show of cheerfulness, Stanhope helps him to drink some, light-heartedly saying that he hopes Raleigh doesn't mind that it's got some tea leaves in it. The two remain in silence for a long time. Stanhope sits with one hand on Raleigh's arm, and Raleigh lies very still. When Raleigh speaks again, it is hardly above a whisper, 
and it is only to ask if they can have a light, as it's, it's so frightfully dark and cold. This is the last time that Raleigh speaks, although we do hear something between a sob and a moan coming from where he is lying. When San Hope returns to the bed, he realises that Raleigh has slipped away. He sits on the bench behind the table with his back to the wall and stares listlessly across at the boy on Osborne's bed. The solitary candle flame throws up the lines on his pale, drawn face and the dark shadows under his tired eyes. He is not left to his grief for long, however. We are aware that the attack is raging outside as the thudding of the shells rises and falls like an angry sea and a private soldier soon comes scrambling down the steps with the message from Trotter that he is to come at once. The way in which Stanhope rises stiffly and takes his helmet from the table as he says, All right, Broughton, I'm coming, pauses for a moment by Osborne's bed and lightly runs his fingers over Raleigh's tousled hair before going stiffly up the steps gives the audience a striking sense of the impotence of the men and how their individual lives are irrelevant to those conducting the war. The self-restraint and dignity shown by Stanhope at this moment prevents the play from descending into sentimentality. The play ends on the powerful image of the destruction of the dugout. The whine of a shell rises to a shriek and bursts the dugout roof. The shock stabs out the candle flame. The timber props of the door cave slowly in. Sandbags fall and block the passage to the open air, effectively entombing Raleigh, as well as the hopes and dreams of an entire lost generation. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.